Thank you, guys. Thank you for the introduction. Um, when I first meet people, oftentimes the conversation goes something like, hello, hey, nice to meet you. So what do you do? And I say, so soil science. They say, interesting, soil science. <laughs> and I have to disappoint them pretty much every time and tell them, I'm sorry, I study soil, I study soil science. And what follows is, is a bit uncomfortable, it's a realization as I got to thinking that is the idea of studying the soul, this immaterial body, consciousness, the seat of moral decisions, is that a more comfortable idea to us now as the earth beneath our feet? And it got me thinking about, is there a moral dilemma between human species, between our species, and the land? Have we become so detached from the natural world that we're unaware that our life, our lives, depend on this finite, alive, and deteriorating resource? And that we haven't really ever learned our lesson that the greatest civilizations of man in Mesopotamia, in the Indus Valley, that these civilizations have been brought to their knees by human-induced soil degradation. But this all began for me, this rather circuitous route to soils. It began as a history student, and I was studying human conflict. And I was studying what was happening at the time in Western and Southern Sudan, and what is still happening there. And at the time I was looking and, and trying to figure out what on earth, what circumstances, what events could bring about such level of violence among humans. And as I was digging in to the political and the ethnic and the religious underpinnings of this conflict and this displacement that we see, what I found in a footnote to a side note and began reading about was land deterioration, significant land deterioration, desertification, in fact. The Sahara Desert moving southward at 30 kilometers, 18 and a half miles a year. And this obviously has an impact. So I thought, why is no one talking about this? Well, soils aren't sexy. No one wants to talk about soils when there's so much else one can talk about. But what I, what I found, what I discovered was that when a desert is moving southward, if this human-induced soil degradation is being caused, you have Arab nomads moving upon sedentary Africans. You have an ethnic conflict. You have Arab Muslims moving upon sedentary African Christians. You have a religious conflict. And there, moving forward, you have a political conflict when a central government in Khartoum takes advantage of that localized conflict, enacting genocide. All of a sudden, all of this is based in the land. So that got me thinking as I looked at what, what this looked like, this desert. I realized, or I was wondering, can we avoid human conflict by sustaining the land? And if so, what are the key challenges to sustaining that land? Which brought me here, here, to northern Haiti. And I wanted to seek out those answers. And what I found became abundantly clear. There were two challenges, soil erosion and lack of soil fertility. And in this region, I was in the Artibonit region of northern Haiti, and this is what I saw. And what I saw is farmers having to grow on increasingly marginal landscapes, these landscapes that lead to a loss of topsoil. Topsoil, three centimeters of which takes a thousand years to form. And that that loss of topsoil ends up in our waterways, in their waterways, causing increased sedimentation, causing obviously huge environmental effects with our wildlife, and even in some cases, completely restricting waterways. Now, what we, what we wanted to figure out though was what can we do? What can we do about erosion? Because this seems like such a widespread problem. And you have to begin somewhere. And so we had about 20 homes 
20 concrete homes, that as soon as the rainy season started, we knew that it was going to be completely inundated by eroded soil from a hill slope, not even a very steep hill slope. And so what we did is designed a system of contour ditches. And those contour ditches were meant to be a catchment for the water, and then taking this grass, this beautiful, amazing panacea of a grass called vetiver that can live in super saturated and super drought-like conditions, and plant it upslope and downslope of each of those ditches. So you're stabilizing the hill slope, and you're directing water laterally. And so what we realized through this project was, as widespread as this issue is, we have to start somewhere. You have to start one hill slope at a time, stabilizing soil one hill slope at a time. But this is only one of the problems, but it leads into the second, a lack of soil fertility. And what I mean by that is that a soil has to have nutrients to give us food, to grow anything. And a lack of soil fertility is a key issue in Haiti because of erosion, but it's a key issue all over the world, even in this country. But to solve it, the problem, to solve that problem, the, the answer was really right under our noses. And it happens to be right under your seats. It's a resource that we all produce and that we currently call a waste product. It's our poop and our urine. <laughs> and what is so cool about this is that even though we live in a very luxurious world where we don't have to interact with that very much, it's actually to our detriment because what we see is a great potential in building composting toilets like this one that I designed where we're taking solid waste, we're mixing it with carbon materials, we're composting it, and now we have a super rich nutrient to put on the soil. We have a fertilizer that's free. And we also can take the urine, we can dilute it, and apply it as a nitrogen fertilizer. So not only did we deal with this issue of fertility, we also are helping improve sanitation, which, as we well know, was a leading cause to groundwater contamination that led to the most recent outbreak of cholera. So two birds, one stone. But the fact of these toilets is that you're also affording these individuals, this school of 500 children that this was built for, the dignity and respect of sanitation, um, but that it keeps on giving, and it gives to the local community, and it gives to their future, a more sustainable future. But this left me wondering, well, what, what does it look like here in this country? What do soils and agriculture look like in the States? And that brought me here to a small organic farm in North Texas, in Waxahachie. And on this farm, we had about two and a half acres and we fed 75 people off of those two and a half acres, which is pretty cool considering you know, how we think of food in this country. And aside from realizing that it's just extremely difficult to grow food, um, I also realized that we think that we're just so good at growing food here, that we're just so skilled at growing food. But in fact, it's really just dumb luck that we as European colonizers landed on a continent that has 22% of the world's most highly productive soils called mollusol. Whereas most of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, has one to 3%. So it has more to do with this happenstance, this land that we ended up on, instead of our, our innate ability to grow food. And that really made me question our, or wonder about our practices and our model of agriculture in this country. And then oftentimes we put yield over stewardship. We put product over natural resources. And even though there are conservation efforts in this country, it brought me to realize that sustaining our soils has just as much to do with changing our awareness and our mindset as it does about changing our practices. And at this point in time, I was uncertain of what to do next, because obviously I like to jump around. But I was wondering, well, where is the need? What do we need to do? Do we need to research? And I felt like I needed to know the science. And I was a historian, for goodness sake, because I wasn't even a scientist. But I wanted to figure out where that need was. And where that need was is here. 
subsistence agriculture, the smallholder growers, they grow over 70% of the world's food. And these 500 million smallholder growers that live throughout Central and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South and Southeast Asia are also those individuals that are the most affected by an increasingly erratic and unpredictable climate, by international land grabs, by unsustainable agricultural practices, some of which came from each of their post-colonial histories. To address their need, to address their resiliency, we need to have some sort of model, we need to have some sort of approach to improve their livelihoods, their outlook, and our own, in fact. And what that model is called is conservation agriculture. And this model has three tiers, three ideas. The first is we leave crop residues on the ground. After we harvest, we leave all those residues, we let them decompose and cover the soil surface. The second is we rotate our crops. We let each crop pull different nutrients at different times. And the third is not tilling, is not tilling the soil. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, but Becca, if we don't till, then how can we put seed into the ground? Well, that's where these babies come in. So what my research is now is to test out hand planters. These are all hand planters that are used throughout the developing world. We have a Brazilian jab, a Chinese planting hoe, a Haraka rolling planter. And the idea is, can we test the tools that farmers currently use in a conservation agriculture model? Can we see if they can actually get through the ground, get through the residue, and afford these smallholders an opportunity of greater resiliency, of greater stability in the future, sustaining their soils and improving their yields at the same time so that they can be more stable smallholders? Because what we're seeing is that many of these growers, they can't subsist off of their land, and they end up moving to an urban squalor. So the idea is, can we sustain their livelihoods as they are, improve their yields, and improve their futures? So this, this trajectory, this circuitous route that I took to soils, is I think one that made me realize that just as much as there is a challenge in soils and sustaining them, that's also where our hope lies. And each one of us in our own respective fields and lives, each one of us has to contend with soils. As an engineer, we'll have to contend with, with more eroding soils. As a nurse, we're gonna have to address less nutritious foods because our soils are less fertile. And being mindful in our own ways is really our, our hope. And even though we all have to contend with that future, we all each in our own ways, even my two-year-old, we can all contribute. We can all contribute to a more sustainable future, especially here in Knoxville. We can buy locally. We can buy organic foods. We can try to grow our own food. We can make compost. We can live mindfully about how the rest of the world operates and what those key challenges are. Mitigating climate change, each of us in our own way, thereby contributing to a more sustainable future for our community, for us as individuals, and for the community at large. Thank you for your time. Thank you.